So I, I study bees um, ordinarily, but I, I'm, to start with, not going to talk about bees tonight. Um, actually, I think a lot of you probably heard me speak before, and I apologize straight away if there's a bit of overlap with things you've heard before. I've got some of our undergrads here who've definitely heard some of this before. Um, but there are, even if you've heard me speak more than once, there are definitely some new things tonight. So um, see if you can spot them. Um, but I thought I'd start off um, here which might seem a little odd to those of you who haven't, haven't heard me talk about Easter Island before. I'm sure you recognize this place. It's a little island in uh, the Pacific. It's one of the most remote inhabited islands on Earth. Um, and it has an interesting story um, that's relevant to what I'm going to go on to talk about. So Easter Island is only about 10 or so miles across, middle of the nowhere, hundreds and hundreds of miles from any other island. And it was colonized about 800 years ago by Polynesians who were sailing eastwards across the Pacific, colonizing the islands in their little dugout canoes with their family and their pigs and whatever. Um, and they got to Easter Island, and when they arrived, it was, it was densely forested. It had fertile volcanic soils. It had some fat indigenous flightless pigeons running around that were easy to catch and good to eat, and lots of seabirds nested on the island so you could eat their eggs. So they settled, and life was pretty good, and they started clearing areas to farm. Uh, and the population grew to, we think, about 10,000 people. Um, they had enough leisure time, and life was good enough for them to spend time building, carving these bizarre rock um, statues and dragging them around the island and arranging them uh, in rows and so on. We have no idea why. Um, but the interesting thing is that when, when European explorers rediscovered the island about 500 years later, the population had collapsed. There'd been a, a kind of human catastrophe. There were, it had gone from maybe 10,000 to a few hundred people that were left, and they were starving. They had turned to cannibalism. They were eating rats and, and not much else. Um, and so what had happened? Um, well, basically, they'd, they'd depleted the resources on the island. They hadn't lived sustainably. They'd cleared the forests. In fact, they cleared every single tree um, and it's kind of interesting because it's such a small island. The person who cut down the last tree probably knew it was the last tree. Um, he knew they needed trees for firewood and for building houses and for making boats if they wanted to go fishing and so on. But he still cut it down. It could have been a she, I guess. Who knows? Um, and, but without the forests to hold the soil together, the soil washed away. And so it became infertile, so they couldn't grow their crops. And they'd long since eaten all of the flightless birds, and the seabirds had long since stopped nesting there because they'd been eating all the eggs. So there was nothing left. Uh, and they couldn't really leave because they had no timber to build boats, so they starved. Um, the reason I'm saying, talking about this, is because you can make a pretty good argument that you can see the globe today um, as facing exactly the same problems they faced. And we're making the same mistakes they made. Uh, and we know we're making them, but we still carry on, which I find kind of bizarre um, that we don't seem able to learn lessons from, from what's happened in the past. So we are clearing the forests. Uh, all my life, we've been chopping down tropical forests. And all my life, people have been saying, this is a really bad idea. We should stop. But we haven't in the last 50 years. And I don't know if we will in the next 50 years, at the end of which there won't be a fat lot left. Um, so we're turning lots of the surface of the earth into this kind of um, habitat, monocultures, big crop monocultures. You can see where I got the photo from. I didn't bother to go there. But you can jump around the world. And a lot of it looks like this. Uh, those are all different European countries. I think the last one is North America. Um, this is how we grow food, or a lot of food. To, it, the justification for doing this is to feed the human population, which gets bigger every year. Um, this is an interesting way of putting that. I, I read the other day, which is that 170,000 people will sit down for dinner tonight who didn't sit down for dinner yesterday. That's, that's a reasonable sized city added to the human population every single day. So we need to feed those people somehow. There's going to be 9 or 10 billion of us by 2050. Um, and so we need to grow food um, to feed people. But at the moment, the way we're doing it is doing an awful lot of harm to the environment. And I'll come to the end. Maybe there are alternatives that we need to think about if we're not going to wipe out life on Earth. So farming like this certainly has 
some problems, uh, uh, not least of which is that just like the people on Easter Island, we're losing our soil. Um, so if you plough big areas of land and leave the soil bare and then sow another crop, if it rains heavily or you get strong winds during that period when the soil is unprotected, it washes away or blows away. And the carbon, every time you plough the soil, you, you damage the soil structure and you increase the rate at which um, carbon, organic compounds in the soil are oxidised, which adds to the greenhouse effect. Um, most people don't know this, but farming, um, in all its different aspects, contributes about a third of all greenhouse gas emissions, and it's actually more than all power generation on the planet um, comes from farming. And some of that's from, from damage to soils. So this is a picture of Madagascar that shows you one of the biggest rivers in Madagascar taken from space, and the reason it's red is because all the soil is washing out to sea, which not only um, is terrible if you're a farmer and you're not going to have any soil left in a few decades' time, but obviously it does an awful lot of damage to the, to the marine ecosystems as well and contributes, of course, to silting of rivers, uh, which causes problems with drainage and increases flooding and, and so on and so on. It seems like a pretty bad idea. And if you think this is something that's largely confined to the tropics, it isn't. Um, so apologies, this is a bit of a grainy old picture. Uh, but this is from um, Holm Fen in East Anglia, where in 1850 they drove a, a metal post into the ground. Um, the flat bit was at ground level in 1850. And today it's 15 feet up in the air because the soil, we used to have these really deep beds of peat in the fens that had been laid down over tens or hundreds of thousands of years. It's been gently eroding due to drainage and farming um, for the last 150 years. And so the, the whole landscape is now 15 feet lower than it was before. Um, you can't go on doing that forever, fairly obviously. So the clearance of land and our other activities around the globe um, has already led to lots of extinctions. And it's really, I think, kind of sad to think about the amazing creatures that used to live on Earth before we got rid of them all. Um, all of these things were wiped out, and, and many more, by early man as he spread out from Africa. The, the world was populated with these amazing giant mammals, mammoths and tree sloths and saber-toothed tigers and so on. And they all disappeared in the wake of our arrival. So we started what's now known as the, the sixth mass extinction event. Before we started farming, initially it was just by hunting and so on. Uh, many of them we perhaps didn't kill directly, but we killed their prey, as in the case of the tiger. Uh, but one way or another, wherever man arrived, these, these things disappeared. And the animals that we now most highly prize and spend most money on um, in terms of conservation efforts are the last few of these, these uh, the megafauna, the big mammals that used to roam the earth in abundance before we came along. Um, so it's thought that we might be right now losing about 10,000 species per year, which is pretty terrifying. Um, and we don't know how that's going to change as climate change kicks in and the human population continues to grow and so on. It's really difficult. So this talk is a bit depressing. Um, there may be some cheerful bits, I think. Um, but it's, it's, it's been predicted, uh, not unreasonably, that we might lose two-thirds of all species on Earth by the end of this century, which I won't live to see. Probably very few people here will, who knows. But our children almost certainly will, and it sounds like a pretty dismal place to me. Um, so maybe we need to think and do something differently. Uh, we've already lost about a 1,000 bird species um, and um, a lot more racing towards joining them. So... Does it really matter that things are going extinct? So this is a quote from, from The Guardian from nine years ago. I don't, I don't know who Marcel Berlins is, but I, and I feel a bit mean that I pick on him by uh, bringing, repeating his quote. But he did write it in a national newspaper, so it's fair enough, I think. So he says, should we worry about the endangerment of all species? Pandas and tigers, for sure. But armadillos? I don't know what he has against armadillos. It's, it seems a bit odd. Um, I think they're nice, but anyway. Um, I passionately believe in saving the whale. Does he think there's just one whale? <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, the tiger, the orangutan, the sea turtle, and many other specifically identified species. So they only matter if they've been identified. Actually, we've probably only identified maybe 10% of life on Earth. So the 90% we haven't identified apparently don't count, according to him. 
Um, but will the world and humankind be very much the poorer if we lose a thousand or so species? I, I, I'm really horrified by that kind of take on things. Um, I just think, well, for one, there are two arguments as to why we should be concerned. One is that many of these species are useful or potentially useful to us, and I will eventually talk about bees as an obvious example. Uh, but even if something is of no earthly use to us, some obscure butterfly that lives in a rainforest and, and that we don't interact with at all and we get no benefit from its existence, it still surely has a, as much right to live here as we do. We shouldn't just be going around exterminating these things that we haven't even identified yet. Um, so uh, I, I, it really concerns me that people have that kind of attitude. So not only are things going extinct, but there's good evidence that the things that haven't gone extinct are much less abundance. The, the people have started talking recently about the, the collapse in bioabundance. Um, so we have good data for some groups of wildlife, and particularly for countries like Britain, where pe the, we study our wildlife more than anybody else. And um, uh, for, the, for the taxa that we have figures for, it's pretty depressing reading. So top right, those are bird <coughs> figures. Uh, and it's separated out by type of bird. And you can see that farmland birds are doing really, really badly. Um, they've declined by about 50% since 1970 in terms of numbers of in individuals. Um, butterflies and moths are also doing pretty appallingly. Um, the World Wildlife Fund um, relatively recently, last year I think it was, uh, estimated, they tried to estimate how many vertebrates, how many wild animals with spines um, there were on the planet and how it had changed since 1970. And, they, and so vertebrates of mammals, fish, reptiles, fibian, amphibians, and birds. Um, and their best estimate was that the number had dropped by a little over half since 1970 globally. So that's less than my lifetime. In less than my lifetime, the number of wild animals with which we share the planet has, has more than halved, um, which is pretty terrifying. Some other data that's just come to light, there was a story in Science Magazine last week and it's uh, something that I, I've been involved in analyzing. These are um, numbers from Germany where some entomologists have been putting up these weird um, tent-like malaise traps for the last 30 or so years, since the late 1980s. And they catch flying insects. The flying insects bump into them and, and crawl upwards to escape and end up falling into a pot of alcohol. Um, and they, they, they just measured the, the weight of flying insects that they caught per week in these traps, um, and it's, it's dropped by 78% since 1989. So just flying insects have decreased, apparently, by 80% over that time period. Uh, we'd, it, the, and these are actually nature reserves. This wasn't in farmland. These were small nature reserves being managed for biodiversity. So something pretty, pretty terrifying seems to be happening. So what about the bees? Um, the things that I work on. Um, well, so far as we know, the pattern is, is unfortunately quite similar. Uh, many of you will have seen one of my favorite illustrations of that before. So this is just one example of a, of a British bumblebee which uh, has fared poorly in, uh, in the last 100 years. Um, so this is a thing called the great yellow bumblebee, which won't be familiar to many of you, because um, it no longer lives around here. So that was where it used to be found in Britain um, between 1900 and 1950. Um, that's where it was found in the second half of the 20th century, and, and that's today. So it's extinct in England and Wales, and you've got a long drive on your hands, plus a boat journey if you want to get to somewhere with a good chance of seeing one. Uh, the Western Isles is, is one of the best places where it still thrives. Um, but it's, it's teetering on the edge of going extinct, and, and actually three other bumblebees in the UK have gone completely extinct. Um, one species of bumblebee recently went globally extinct. It was an American species, Franklin's bumblebee, which is gone forever. And some others in North America are also doing badly. So this isn't something that's confined to Britain or Europe. Um, these are, this is a, a thing, it's, its common name is the rusty-patched bumblebee. Really pretty beast. And it used to be the, the commonest bumblebee in eastern North America. Uh, there were millions of them. It was if you're familiar with bumblebees, it was kind of the equivalent of the buff tail bumblebee. You saw them in your gardens, and every meadow would have thousands of them. Uh, the black area shows you where it used to be abundant. The red dots show you records 
since 2002, and most of those were single bees. Um, the best estimate is that the actual population of this species has dropped by about 99.9 .9 or more percent in the, since, and only since 1995, so this is, this is ongoing, and th this beast was actually just, just declared um, endangered formally by the American government. Donald tried to stop it for some bizarre reason. Uh, he does many strange things, obviously, but he didn't want a bumblebee to receive official protection either, one of his lesser known um, misdeeds, but uh, it did get through in the end, thankfully. He was busy with other stuff, I guess. Um, so, so, of course, with bees, um, forgive me if you know this, but we should have particular reason to be worried at their disappearance because they do benefit us. We know full well that they pollinate lots of stuff that we like to eat, and those are just a few examples. Uh, so if we lose the bees, we'd lose about a third of the food that, that mankind consumes, and it would include most of the nice stuff, the tomatoes, the, the, the fruit like blueberries and strawberries and raspberries and chili peppers and and coffee and so on. So life would be rubbish if we didn't have bees, as illustrated by this before and after. So a supermarket, uh, take away the bees, and that's what you have. Um, oranges don't pollinate themselves, so they'd be fine, but there wouldn't be a fat lot else left on the shelves. Now, so maybe we don't need to worry, though, because um, there's at least three labs in the world making robot bees. So soon we won't need any bees um, because we'll be able to build little drones, which is sorry, it's sort of a joke, um, which will fly around and pollinate our flowers for us. Um, I don't know what you think about that, but it, it, it scares the hell out of me. Um, it, we seem to have this idea that technology can just fix stuff, that you know, when all the soil has washed into the sea, we'll just grow things hydroponically, which will be fine. Um, except until the water runs out, and then I'm not quite sure what we'll do. But anyway, um, and when the bees all die, we'll just build little robots, and they'll take the role of bees over. And of course, they won't be affected by things like pesticides, um, so, so that'll be good. Um, so there's, a, the, there's, as I say, three labs in the world, at least, um, that have published papers on robot bees that they've built. Um, the one top right is absolutely rubbish, I have to say. It's huge. Um, but the ones the bottom left seem a little more plausible. But if you just think about it for a second, so the cost of these things, that if you just wanted to replace the honeybee, which is one species of bee, there are 20,000 species of bee, but supposing we were just going to replace the honeybee, um, there are at any one time on the earth about 3.2 trillion honeybees. Um, so it's going to cost quite a bit to build 3.2 little robots, I imagine, even if they were... Supposing you could build them for a penny each, which would be pretty impressive engineering if you could, uh, that's still 32 billion pounds that you'd have to spend. And how long would these things last? They'd get caught out in the rain, they'd get stuck in spider's webs, they'd break down. What about the repair bills? Um, you know, the, the countryside would end up littered with these spiky little dead bees, I imagine. Um, compare that to real bees, which are self-replicating, biodegradable, self-powering, no carbon <laughs> footprint associated with them at all. Um, and, uh, and, of course, they give us honey as well as a bonus in the case of the honeybee. It seems completely nuts that we might think that this was an alternative. But anyway, apparently some people do. Okay, so I've talked about all these, these depressing declines. If we just focus on Britain for a bit, there seems to be a bit of a puzzle. Um, so... Um, during the 20th century, or most of the 20th century, we tried to increase food production. It was government policy to encourage farmers to plough up flower-rich grasslands and improve them, in inverted commas, um, uh, and to pull out hedges and to drain marshes and so on. It, to, to basically, it, it stemmed from the Second World War when uh, we needed to be self-sufficient uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but the policies that were introduced in the Second World War and during rationing subsequently were, were left in place until the 1990s. Um, and all of that habitat loss that was done in the name of food production drove a lot of these wildlife declines, um, in a British context at least. But we stopped doing this. We realized the harm we were doing. Uh, and in the 1990s, we started introducing agri-environment schemes that are meant to... Um, to pay farmers to look after the environment. 
to replant hedges, to plant flowers, to not cut their hedges too often, and do all sorts of other things. We spend about 400 million taxpayers' money every year at the moment, who knows what will happen soon, um, on supporting wildlife on farmland. And we've been doing that for 20 odd years, and yet all the figures suggest that our wildlife is, is still disappearing, um, which is a little puzzling. So I'm gonna talk about one possible explanation as to why that's happening. And that relates to, to pesticides, um, which is a bit of a hot topic at the moment. Um, and particularly kind of controversial, well, controversial because there's disagreement to, as to how important pesticides are in driving wildlife declines, but also topical because we have a government at the moment and likely to keep that government who uh, are very kind of pro-pesticides. They, they, their focus is on the economy. They don't seem to care about the environment at all, is my take. Um, and they're very likely to deregulate pesticide use, to get rid of restrictions that have been brought in from Europe on what is thought to be the more harmful pesticides. So we could see some really significant changes to farming, and from an environmental perspective, not for the good um, coming up. But anyway, let me explain what this is for those of you that haven't seen it before. So um, my group at Sussex University have been studying uh, bumblebees and the effects of pesticides on bumblebees for the last uh, four or five years. And we've been working on farms in, in the, the local area and we asked the farmers to tell us what pesticides they used on each field. Um, and this rather bewildering table um, is, is the list of pesticides in chronological order applied to a single oilseed rape field um, by a, a local farmer during the cycle from when he sowed the crop in, um, this was, that was in August 2012, to when he harvested in June 2013. And in that period of whatever that is, 10 months, he put all these different chemicals onto it. So there's a couple of fertilizers in there, and there's, there's 20 different pesticides. It includes herbicides and molluscicides and insecticides and fungicides. Um, 20 different toxins, and I, I, I was quite shocked when I saw this. This is completely typical. This farmer is not a bad farmer. He was just following the advice of his agronomist. He was doing what most farmers do. On average, Sussex farmers use slightly fewer pesticides each year than, than the UK mean. So this is, this is, this is the list, list could be worse. Um, but if you ask yourself this, if you were growing this stuff to eat yourself, if you were growing food in your garden or on your allotment to feed to your kids, uh, or for your supper, would you be comfortable putting 20 different pesticides on it before you ate it? I wouldn't. Um, it seems intuitively a bit foolish. And it also seems somewhat worrying um, that we need so many chemicals. Do we really need so many chemicals? Well, I'll come to that in, in, in a little while. Um, from a bee's perspective, this is a flowering crop, and bees visit it. Um, to feed on the nectar and pollen. And of course, the crop benefits from being pollinated. Um, but from a bee's perspective, some of these chemicals are really quite dangerous. So uh, the orange ones are insecticides, which are obviously going to be poisonous to bees. Um, uh, and the, the purpley blue ones are fungicides, which aren't themselves toxic to bees, but have been discovered to act synergistically with insecticides. So, um, they prevent the detoxification mechanism of the bee. So if you can give loads of fungicide to a bee, and it's absolutely fine, but if you give fungicide to a bee and a little tiny bit of insecticide, the insecticide can become up to a thousand times more toxic than it would be on its own because of the action of the fungicide. And obviously both are being used together on these crops, so the bees are being exposed to a whole cocktail of potentially harmful chemicals. And the regulatory process, the, the testing to see whether these chemicals are harmful to insects, doesn't take any account of the fact that in the real world, insects such as bees are exposed to mixtures of chemicals. The regulatory process, just you, they take some bees and they expose them to one chemical, this, whatever the new chemical is, and if the bee is still alive after 48 hours, then that's fine. They never expose them to multiple chemicals together. But if you're a bee flying into this field, you're gonna be exposed to a whole bag of stuff, um, and we have no idea really what that does to them. Um, so let me just, sorry, let me just focus in on one type of chemical which you've probably all heard of, 
and tell you a little bit more about them. Um, so this particular crop was treated as a seed with something called thiamethoxam, which is a neonicotinoid insecticide. Uh, they're commonly used as seed dressings, so they're put on the crop, on, on the seeds, before the farmer buys them as a seed coating. Um, so the, it's a nice system from the farmer's point of view. It's an insecticide that he doesn't have to do anything. He just buys the seed and he sows it in the ground and the, the coating dissolves in the, in the water, in the moisture in the soil, and then the little seedling, as it grows, is supposed to suck up the pesticide. It's systemic. It goes to all parts. It goes to the, all the, the leaves, the roots, and whatever, and protects the plant against herbivores, which sounds like a great system from a farming perspective. And, and they've become very popular insecticides for almost all arable crops and also uh, fruit crops and so on. Uh, in recent years. It's the newest generation of insecticides available to farmers. Um, there are, in the UK, there are five different ones. There you go, with long names that are hard to remember, but they're all broadly similar. Um, these are some oilseed rape seeds that are um, treated, and they put some dye on so the farmer knows that those are treated seeds. Uh, the oilseed rape seeds aren't naturally bright purple. Um, uh, so that just shows you the, the amounts of these different chemicals that are used on the UK, and I'll, I'll put that into a context in a second. But uh, um, So with roughly 100,000 kilos in 2010, it's gone up to about 110,000 kilos of these chemicals going onto the British landscape every year. Um, that's just farming use. You can also buy them um, uh, for garden use. Some of them have been withdrawn, but some are still available for garden use, and it really worries me that there are so many chemicals available in your local garden center or uh, B&Q or whatever um, to spray willy-nilly onto your flowers or vegetables or whatever. Um, there really isn't any need in a garden. I mean, you, can, you can have a good debate about how important pesticides may be for farming, um, but if you're growing flowers or, or vegetables in your garden, you really, really don't need to use insecticides or other pesticides. I don't think. I don't use any in my garden. And if you've got some aphids on your roses, for example, some people will rush out and buy an insecticide and blast away. They probably don't read the instructions. They chuck a bit extra on for good luck. But is that really necessary? If you've got some aphids on your roses, if you leave them well alone, chances are a ladybird or a hoverfly will come and eat them. Worst case scenario, you've still got some aphids on your roses and it hasn't really done any great harm. Um, so why do you need to go out and spray your garden with poison. It seems nuts. People also apply them to their dogs and cats. Um, uh, this stuff, Advocate, is routinely used prophylactically on dogs and cats as a flea treatment. Um, and, and it just says in really, really tiny font that it's imidacloprid, which is one of these neonicotinoids. Um, the dose you put on a, a medium-sized dog once a month, if you follow your vet's advice, even when it hasn't got fleas, because just in case it might get some, um, is enough to kill 60 million honeybees or 60 partridges, um, uh, probably one dog um, if it were to consume it, but you put it on the back and you drip it onto the back of their neck um, so the dog can't lick it. But then don't your kids come and stroke the back of the dog's neck and give it a hug? And do you really want your kids putting their face in neurotoxin? Uh, anyway, there you go. That's a brilliant promotion from Bayer, one of the main manufacturers of these chemicals. Free seeds for bees with your bee-killing chemicals so you can grow beautiful flowers and suck in all the bees and then kill them with your bug gun. <laughs> so you might not use any of these chemicals yourself in your gardens. I'm sure there's lots of write-on people here like me that wouldn't dream of spraying their flowers with insecticides. Um, but there's something else you should be worried about. So. Um, uh, you should read. I don't normally recommend the Daily Mail, but this Saturday there will be an exciting story about uh, the pesticides in the plants that you can buy from your garden centre. So this is some work we've been doing at Sussex Uni. Um, lots of flowers these days are marketed as being bee-friendly. Um, the Royal Horticultural Society have their Perfect for Pollinator logo, which garden centres can print and stick on the labels of any plant which has been deemed by the RHS to be good for bees or butterflies or, or whatever. Um, there's a different logo there on, the, on the, those pretty scabiouses, but it's, 
It's used as a marketing ploy to tell people this, this is good for wildlife. You can take, buy these pretty flowers, put them in your garden, and it will attract in bees and so on. And people love, a lot of people love that. And I've spent years encouraging people to plant bee-friendly flowers in their garden. Um, but if, you, if, if, as we've done, you test these plants um, to see what chemicals are in them, um, the answer is a lot. Sorry for putting up another horrible table. So, so we tested 29 different garden center plants bought from local garden centers, and, and uh, you can see the names, a bit of a naming and shaming going on. But it's the, it's, it's the same for all of them. So we've got B and Q and Aldi and Y Vale and, and so on, home base. Um, I haven't gone into all, given you all the details, but um, so these, these are how many different insecticides and fungicides were in plants. And these were all bee-friendly plants, bee-friendly in inverted commas, given what's in them. Um, so one of them, there's a heather up there, I've lost where it is, um, which has no less than 10 different pesticides in it, five different insecticides. And just over 50% uh, of these plants had the neonicotinoids that had been banned um, for use on arable crops. I, I haven't gone into the ban yet, but the, the European Union imposed a ban in 2013 on the use of these chemicals on things that flower in farming. Um, and yet they're commonly turning up at quite high concentrations in these pretty flowers that we know attract bees that you might buy to put in your garden. And I think it's an absolute scandal that, that garden centers are selling these things as bee friendly. And the risk is that you buy them and actually you're killing the, bee, the very bees that you wanted to save. Seems pretty outrageous, but there you go. So uh, a quick take home message is, Grow plants from seeds or plant swap with your neighbors rather than buying them from the garden center unless they guarantee that they're organic. Uh, I'm hoping the RHS will push for or be embarrassed into insisting that um, people either label plants to say what they've been treated with or for bee-friendly plants guarantee that they're um, free of pesticides. But we'll see how it goes. Hence getting the Daily Mail to, to make a bit of a fuss about it. So back to these neonic things. Um, this just shows you how the use has changed over time in the UK. So as I said, these are the newest insecticides you can get. Um, not that new. They've been around since the mid-1990s. Um, use has increased a lot over time, um, uh, up to about 110,000 kilos a year at the latest uh, for which we have data. Um, this, was, this was when this moratorium was introduced, which prevents their use on things like oilseed rape. But as you can see, it hasn't actually reduced the amount going in to the landscape. Uh, and these things are really toxic. Um, so you, the way you measure the toxicity of a chemical is with an LD50 that stands for the lethal dose that kills 50%. And I've always, already said about how the dose you put on a dog would kill 60 million honeybees. Well, that's because it only takes four nanograms, four billionths of a gram of one of these chemicals um, to give that LD50 dose to um, a bee, um, which means that one teaspoon, five grams, is enough to give a lethal dose to one and a quarter billion honeybees, and we're applying 110,000 kilos to the landscape, um, which obviously has the potential to do an awful lot of harm to our insect life, or things that eat insects. Um, I put up, for, just for comparison, some other pesticides, uh, some other insecticides. Everyone's heard of DDT, horrible stuff. Um, but purely weight for weight, it's about 7,000 times less toxic to a bee than this new generation of insecticides. Um, so I, meant, I explained how these things work. They're normally um, applied to the seed, and uh, it's sown in the ground, and then they're supposed to be sucked up by the crop and protect the crop. But it turns out that they're not very good at getting into the crop where they're supposed to go. Uh, only about 5% of the active ingredient is taken up by the crop, which means that the rest, 95%, is going into the soil or a little bit of it blows around in dust, and it's highly toxic dust. And because these chemicals are water-soluble, they're turning up in streams quite regularly um, uh, at concentrations that can kill aquatic wildlife, as we'll see in a second. And they're also in the soil uh, at the edges of the fields where the roots of wildflowers and hedgerow plants are, and they can, the whole way they work is by being sucked up by the roots of plants. Um, it's meant to go into the crop, but they're just as easily sucked up by the roots of 
wildflowers growing in a hedgerow, or the hedgerow plants themselves, like hawthorn or blackthorn and so on, which flower and attract insects. Um, but it turns out, um, contain insecticides these days. Um, so this is something we've been studying again. We sampled the pollen and nectar from wildflowers growing in hedgerows on arable farms around here. And um, don't worry too much about the details, but um, if you compare, so this was just before the moratorium. We looked at the, the levels of these chemicals in, in the pollen of the actual treated crop and then of wildflowers next to the crop. And strangely, there's more in the wildflowers than there is in the crop. But it means that if you're a bee, wherever you go, if you visit a flowering crop or you visit the flowers in the hedgerow, um, if you live on a farm, you're going to be continually being dosed with neurotoxins, unless you go and fly off into the urban areas, and then you'll get zapped by the stuff that people bought to try and help you. Um, never mind. Um, so um, you might, the, the, it's all very well showing that these things are in the environment. They're in garden flowers. They're in, in wildflowers and so on. But the key question is, are there enough of them to actually do any harm? Um, uh, we, we've, there have been hundreds of experiments on this. I'm just going to tell you about one that, that I'm familiar with, because it was done in my lab. Um, we just wanted to see what effect these chemicals had on bumblebee nests. So we got some bumblebee nests, and we, um, uh, we dosed them with uh, the insecticide, putting it in their food, in their pollen and nectar, at the concentration that's found in the pollen and nectar of the oilseed rape uh, crop if it's treated. And we, we gave them that for a couple of weeks, and then we put the nests, these little bumblebee nests, outside and let them look after themselves. And... Uh, this is the weight of the nests over time, so the control nests grew bigger than those given the, the, the dose they would have got if they'd fed on a treated crop. Uh, and then if you look at how many queens these bumblebee nests produced at the end of the summer, um, the controls that given the healthy food produced it, um, lots of queens, and the ones given the sort of field realistic dose of pesticide produced 85% fewer new queens, which are the ones that start the nests next year. Um, uh, in other words, it would seem that the doses bees get when they visit um, uh, flowers that have been contaminated with these chemicals are enough to actually really impact on colony growth and reproduction and so on. Um, we've also done some experiments locally to see exactly what bees are exposed to. So we know all these chemicals are being used. We know they're in the wildflowers and so on. But it, we also wanted to see how much the bees were bringing back, what kind of dose they were getting. And part of our motivation for doing that was because the experiment I just talked about was criticized because it, we, it was said that we'd given the bees too high, an unrealistically high dose. We'd assumed they were feeding entirely on a treated crop for two weeks, which isn't perhaps what bee nests would naturally do. They might be also feeding on other things that weren't contaminated. So we put bee nests out in Brighton and Lewis and in farmland around about. And then when they collected some pollen, we, we stole their pollen and analyzed it to see what was in it. Not just looking for neonics, but looking for other pesticides. Um, and so these are all different nests. They're paired. There's a, there's a measure for the bees themselves and for the pollen in the nests. The bees don't tend to have much in. They, they, if they're exposed, they either die or they, they detoxify the chemicals. But if you look at the food the bees are collecting, um, well, this nest in particular is absolutely chock full of all sorts of stuff. The dotty stuff is the fungicide that acts synergistically with the insecticides. The black bars are the, the neonics. Um, and if I just overlay the concentration of neonic that we used in that previous experiment that produced an 85% drop in numbers, then there it is. We were told that that was an unrealistically high dose. Well, compare it to the black bars, and it doesn't look unrealistically high to me. So, um, so I think there's pretty good evidence that these things are harming bees. Um, but it may go beyond bees, um, as you could probably work out from, uh, from what I've been saying. Um, so in the last couple of years, there have been a number of studies that have come out which suggest that actually these things might be affecting aquatic insects, uh, butterflies, and uh, birds as well. Um, so just I'll quickly run through these. There was a study from the Netherlands which found that the concentrations of these chemicals in streams predicted how many or few insects there were, aquatic insects. Basically, if there's more insecticide in the stream, there are fewer insects, which probably isn't terribly surprising, but nonetheless interesting. 
Um, also from the Netherlands, they found that birds that eat insects are declining faster in parts of the Netherlands with higher, rate, uh, higher levels of environmental contamination with these insecticides. Um, frequency of honeybee colony death seems to correlate with amounts of them being used. Rates of decline of wild bees in the UK correlate with regional patterns of use of these chemicals. Uh, and a couple of recent studies have come out on butterflies showing that butterfly declines um, correlate with uh, patterns of use of these chemicals, both in, in the UK and in California. Um, actually, given the time, maybe I'll skip the next two slides, which are just about those butterfly declines in a bit more detail. So hopefully I've convinced you that these chemicals probably aren't great news, at least as far as biodiversity and wildlife is concerned. Um, but that, all I'm really telling you is that, is that if you use pesticides, it, it kills things. If you use insecticides, it's going to kill insects. And maybe we should just accept that as a necessary thing, as collateral damage for feeding the human population. Um, and so when people started to worry that these chemicals were killing bees and the European Union started talking about maybe we should restrict their use on flowering crops and eventually did in 2013 introduce a ban on the use of neonics on flowering crops. There was a big backlash. There was a campaign, there still is a campaign from the agrochemical industry arguing that this was impacting massively on farmers' incomes, on profits, on food production. Um, so when this moratorium was proposed, the agrochemical industry predicted um, that it would cost the European Union 17 billion in lost crops, that basically farmers couldn't grow crops without these chemicals, uh, that it was going to be a disaster for the farming industry if this ban was introduced. They were just trying to frighten the politicians, fairly obviously, but nonetheless, they're still doing it to this day, and they're doing it in the UK right now. Um, so they made these predictions about how bad it would be if this ban was put into effect, but it was put into effect, and actually nothing happened at all. Um, uh, so um, yields actually immediately after the moratorium were really good. There were a few localized outbreaks of flea beetle in the UK on oilseed rape, um, but the average yield was close to the highest ever right across Europe. Um, uh, for two years following the ban, and then it dipped a bit because of bad weather in 2016. But there's really been no sign at all of any kind of um, farming disaster uh, if you look at the, at the European scale. And interestingly, there have been some, some other studies which call into question whether all of the use of these chemicals is actually necessary uh, or even does anything useful. Um, so in the US, the Environmental Protection Agency um, announced last year, a big they produced a big report where they'd looked at how effective these chemicals were at increasing the yield of soybeans, which is a really big crop in the United States, uh, used on 30 million hectares, costs about $176 million a year to American farmers. Um, but the Environmental Protection Agency said actually it was completely ineffective. It did nothing at all to increase the yield of the crop. There were no crop pests at the time of year in, 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 in North America um, that uh, attack the crop at the stage at which the, the, the neonics are effective. So farmers, essentially, according to the EPA, were completely wasting their money buying these chemicals. Um, in fact, more broadly, um, a study came out just a couple of weeks ago. This is, this is a Guardian article about a French study um, which looked at um, the relationship between pesticide use and productivity, profit, uh, on a 1,000 French farms and came up with some really surprising conclusions. Um, so they actually found that on 86% of these farms, um, the farmers would produce just as much, get just as much profit or more if they reduced their insecticide use, which seems kind of bizarre, but really interesting, I think. Um, 78% would be more profitable overall if they reduced pesticide use. And it's not that the farmers who weren't using pesticides weren't doing anything at all, but they were just investing more in alternatives to pesticides, things like crop rotations and resistant varieties and, and weeding and so on. Um, but if you took into account the cost of those activities, they were still better off doing that instead of using the pesticides. But most farmers... Um, in the UK in particular, uh, are focused on pesticides as their main 
way to control pests. There was one other really interesting study that came out a couple of years ago, um, which showed that, um, again, back to soya beans, um, that actually using neonic seed dressings on soya beans, um, at least in one particular area where they did this study, um, actually reduced yield by about 5%, um, because um, the seedlings are attacked by, mainly by slugs, and this insecticide does absolutely nothing to the slugs, but it makes the slugs poisonous to the predators of slugs, beetles, um, and so all the ground beetles that would normally eat the slugs died, um, and then the slugs were free to eat all the seedlings. Um, so actually, using insecticides can actually reduce your profit as well as costing money, um, which, which begs the question, why, why are these American farmers using so this dressing on their crops if it's counterproductive? Um, so at this point, sometimes farmers get really angry, and they say that I'm suggesting that they're wasting the, their money, that they're being stupid. Um, but of, of course, they're not. They're being badly advised, is my, my take on this. We're, we're all susceptible to being missold stuff if we're told we need it. Um, and those are just some examples of things that you, most of you at some point will have bought at least one of those things, I think. And I know I'm in dangerous territory suggesting that homeopathy doesn't work in Brighton. Um, <laughs> but anyway, we'll gloss over that one. Um, apparently, you can really buy armadillo repellent. We're back to the armadillos. Um, I just, just, obviously, other people don't like them either, but, um, but it doesn't work. Uh, but they, they're, we constantly, in fact, our whole economy is, is based on persuading us to buy crap we don't need, I sometimes think. Um, but we've certainly all been suckered into buying things that aren't actually necessary. And the problem that farmers have, as far as I can see, is that there's no independent source of advice. So 81% of British agronomists, the people whose job it is to advise farmers on how to control pests in their crop, um, work on commission or just directly work for pesticide companies. So it's hardly surprising that they're telling farmers to use lots of pesticides. And even the 19% of agronomists who are independent have real hard time getting hold of independent information to use to advise farmers because no, no independent organization is doing research on how we might grow food more sustainably um, uh, using fewer pesticides. All of the research into agronomy is funded these days by pesticide companies. Um, so it's really difficult to see how a farmer can know which of these pesticides they really need in the current system. Um, and that's something I think we need to change if we can. So you'll often hear people say that this kind of industrial farming model is just is necessary to feed the world. And if we try to restrict pesticides, people will starve and it'll, all, it'll be our fault for having argued for restrictions on pesticide use. Um, I think that's absolute nonsense um, for, for a number of reasons, um, not, not least of which um, the current food production system is, of course, incredibly... Um, inefficient and wasteful. About a third of all the food that we grow in the world gets thrown away. It doesn't get eaten by anybody, which is absolutely obscene and ridiculous. So we could, in theory, if you could solve food waste, easily said and obviously not easily done, um, but then if we could, we could turn a third of all that intensive farmland over into nature reserves. Uh, wouldn't that be cool? But it's actually much bigger than that um, because, sorry, um, <laughs> Because we also eat too much, and we eat too much of the wrong things. We eat too much processed food. We eat too much meat. We all know that eating meat is a really, really inefficient way of feeding people. Um, and yet, most of us eat more than we should. Um, so if you could persuade people in developed countries, rich people like us, to not stuff their faces quite so much, again, very difficult. If you could persuade people not to eat so much meat, then we wouldn't, again, need to farm so intensively or so much, whichever way you want to play it. Um, so what can we do to make farming a bit more um, environmentally friendly? What, could, what are the alternative ways of growing food? Um, well, so the obvious kind of simple, uh, not particularly radical solution is to really push these agri-environment schemes that so far haven't really worked but seem to offer some potential um, actually, it's a bit complicated to go into, but the whole agri-environment system scheme involves lots of money being given to the entry-level schemes, which there's very little evidence they actually work. They involve farmers doing rather little for the money. Um, whereas the more complicated schemes for which farmers get more money um, 
are more effective. Um, but they're competitive, and there isn't enough money from government for many farmers to go into those higher-level schemes. So most of them aren't in them, and that's probably part of the reason why that's not really working very well. Um, so if we had proper funding for higher-level um, agri-environment schemes, like putting in wildflower strips and so on, there's a wildflower strip along the edge of a crop, then that would probably help, but it's not going to be much good if the crop is being drenched in pesticides and they're all getting into the wildflowers next to it, as we've found on the farms around here. So you need to simultaneously find a way to give farmers good independent advice about how they can reduce their pesticide use, um, which is hard to see how that's going to happen unless the government was actually willing to invest in agronomic research and some kind of advisory system, which, of course, we did used to have 20 years ago, but it was shut down. What else could we do? Well, we could all just buy organic. Um, organic is often dismissed as you couldn't possibly feed the world with organic farming. But actually, on average, organic farms produce about 80% of the yield of conventional farms. Um, and so if you could tackle some of those issues of food waste and overconsumption of meat and so on, actually, you could feed the world from organic farming quite easily. Um, but then there are other possibilities, like permaculture and agroforestry, which are often dismissed as kind of hippie nonsense, perhaps not here, but uh, in some places. Um, uh, but actually, I think they have real potential. There's a lot of logic to the idea that if you grow different crops together, if you don't leave large areas of soil bare so that they can erode and wash away, um, but you have some tree cover and, shr and, and shrubs and grow at your annual, annual crops beneath and between them, um, it's more labor intensive, but it can be really productive. Um, or small holdings, again, um, can be really productive. There's uh, there have been some really interesting studies that show that a really good um, gardener or allotmenter or smallholder can get between four and ten times as much food from an acre of land than is gained from conventional farming. So conventional farming is not as productive as you would think, and it is certainly not the only way to feed the world. So maybe we need to encourage more people to have allotments. Um, whatever we do, we need to do something fast, and we need to do something different, because um, we live on this blue sphere floating in space that's got this little, sorry, it's a bit cheesy, isn't it? Um, it's got this little skin of life on the surface of it that's just a few meters deep. And it's billions of miles through the icy wastes of space to anywhere else that might possibly have life on it. So we should assume this is what we have, and we should bloody well look after it. And I can't understand why we're doing so many stupid things. So practically, given there's election coming up and everything else and Brexit, and all, I just tried to think of some sensible things that I think would be a good idea that we could maybe push for. Um, whatever you think of Jeremy Corbyn, the leaked manifesto has a complete ban on neonics in it, um, which seems to me like quite a reasonable idea. Um, personally, I'd also ban... Um, pesticide use in gardens and uh, cities, because it's really not necessary at all. There are plenty of examples. So France has, has, is bringing in a total ban on all pesticides in all cities of France from 2018. Um, it can be done. Toronto banned them all years ago, and Toronto is fine. It hasn't been sunk under a sea of dandelions or insect pests. Uh, so we don't need them. We could just do away with them completely in gardens. Um, I don't know what the garden centres would sell on all those shelves, but anyway... Um, as I said, it would be really nice to see some public funding for ag independent research to support farmers in producing food more sustainably and in reducing pesticide use. Um, I'd love to see more allotments made available and people being provided with training into how to grow fruit and veg. And you might think that sounds really trivial, but I think lots of people would love to grow their own food, given a bit of support and advice as to how to do it. And it's really productive, and allotments team with wildlife, especially if you don't use pesticides in them. Um, and more broadly, if we could shift at the moment, we pay huge amounts. About, in total, it's about $3 billion a year in, in subsidies to farming. But most of it goes to big industrial-scale farmers. I don't see why the taxpayer should be giving. So, for example, the, the chair of the NFU, Guy Smith, he gets two hundred grand a year in taxpayers' money to be a farmer. Um, that's just essentially the combination of subsidies, entry-level... Uh, most of it's just for owning the land, you get that money. You, some of you will have heard that story that was uh, about uh, how an Arab prince who owns a chunk of East Anglia near Newmarket is given 250 grand a year to rear racehorses. Um, that's farming subsidy, but he's just rearing racehorses. Why should so many taxpayers 
be supporting rich folk who own huge amounts of land. If you instead, whereas in contrast, there's almost no subsidy goes to small scale, small holders, organic farming and so on. You should, if we could turn that on its head, that would be really cool. If we could give, I don't mind giving my taxes to support someone producing healthy, sustainable food locally. I don't see why they should go to some guy who owns a thousand acres of East Anglia. Um, I, I don't realistically think the government's about to turn the whole subsidy system on its head, but I think we should be trying to persuade them to do that. Anyway, um, that's probably enough rambling from me. Um, should you be interested in any more rambling from me, there are some books I could try and sell you at the back. Um, otherwise, um, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>